Well, thank you for having me here, and, and thanks to Peter for the introduction and for the invitation, and thanks to Emily Hebron for uh, hosting me today and taking me in the pouring rain to the Rhododendron Garden, which is very beautiful. Uh, it's a delight to be here, in part because uh, I teach at Penn, and I've been there for almost 10 years, and truly, some of our most dynamic, outstanding graduate students have come from Reed and have made such an impact in the intellectual culture of our uh, institution. And it's a real pleasure to see where they came from and get to see firsthand some of the um, intellectual vivacity that they've described and I know uh, are so fond of. So thank you. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. Uh, I tried to take the lecture topic today as literally as possible and so I'll try to talk about Trump. Um, there are clearly a lot of issues at play, but before I get to the one that I'll focus on, let me just point out what I take to be some of the many live issues for political theory brought into focus by Trump's election. One of these is narcissism. Uh, this, this has been a major criticism of Trump by his critics that he's narcissistic, but I think what we are beginning to pay more attention to is that it's a broader cultural issue, narcissism, which has been dramatically on the rise over the last generation. Uh, the median narcissism rates have gone up 30% over the last 20 years among young people. There are psychological measures that are used to, to calculate these things. 93% of young people today score higher than the median of 20 years ago. And the biggest gains have been in positive answers to statements like, I am an extraordinary person, and I like to look at my body. Um, by 2007, 51% of young people said being famous was one of their top goals. And this compares to the 1970s when it wasn't even in the top 10. Uh, in a recent study of teenage girls, more than twice as many said they'd rather be a personal assistant to a celebrity than president of Harvard. And so I think um, what we're seeing in the culture is the rise of narcissism, and Trump's presidency is but perhaps the most um, emblematic instance of a broader cultural trend that I think deserves uh, study and will no doubt be studied in the period ahead. Uh, a second uh, live issue, I think, brought into focus by the recent events of the Trump campaign and presidency is racism. As we know, Trump has been criticized for being racist. And as I try to digest uh, the events of the past year, it occurs to me that we may be well served to try to disaggregate racism into different strands, which may be racialized, but in different forms. And that perhaps it's a liability of leftist critics to pile so many different phenomena under the singular heading of racism. And so just building off of Trump's own uh, campaign, I can distinguish, in my view, three distinct strands of racialized thinking. One we could call pure discrimination. Trump and his father allegedly didn't rent houses, apartments, to black people in the 70s. That seems illegal and wrong and discriminatory. But there's another strand of racism uh, that uh, I think requires an interpretive step from those who want to accuse the behavior of being racist. When Trump uh, called for the death penalty for five African-American youths who um, allegedly uh, raped a woman in Central Park in the late 80s and continued to call for their punishment even after they had been exonerated, or when Trump called for the birth certificate for Barack Obama to be produced, critics were quick to call it racist. And it may indeed have a racialized element, but here the critics are, um, make, are, putting, are, are basing their criticism on the idea that there is a, a racialized motive that hasn't been expressed. It is, after all, possible to call for the death penalty of criminals regardless of their race. And it's a long-standing tradition in American politics, in fact, to call into question the birth of your political rival and it hasn't always been done against African Americans. And so perhaps this is um, racialized, but it's of a different character to me as opposed to the um, discriminatory housing. And then there's a third strand, uh, which I think is best exemplified by what Trump said in the second debate, where he ignorantly assumed that an African American questioner was from the inner city. This is ignorant, it's perhaps wrong, but it doesn't strike me as hateful, and for that reason, doesn't seem to me to be equivalent to the two other uh, types of racialized thinking. And so my suggestion 
is as the left wonders about whether it should de-emphasize identity politics and focus back on economic concerns or not, one middle ground answer would be to continue to care about identity politics, but to try to be more precise about the language we use and not rely upon an overly generalized notion of racism. But this is a live issue. Uh, another live issue brought to, into focus by the Trump campaign is the obsession we have with the presidential branch and with the presidency. Um, this obsession is reflected in the fact that now presidential campaigns take two years. It's reflected in the fact that many people continually feel that the most recent presidential election is the most important of their lifetime. And if someone they don't like is elected, the republic itself is in dire uh, weakness and in danger of collapsing. Uh, and it's reflected in our popular culture. I haven't watched all of these programs, but I tried to make a note of all the shows on television that take as their object the president or the presidency, either very recently or now. House of Cards, Designated Survivor, Scandal, Political Animals, State of Affairs, Commander in Chief, 24, 1600 Pen, Madam Secretary, The Event, Veep, The West Wing, and Alpha House. And so what does it say about us as a culture that we've become so fascinated with the figure of the president? I'm not sure how this got started. I'm not sure fully what it means, but I think that there is something uh, threatening about this fascination and undemocratic about it. Uh, another issue raised by the election, and this is just still part of my prefatory remarks, would be the question of whether Trump invalidates the democratic theory I had put forward in my first book. Perhaps you won't be surprised to find out that my answer is that it doesn't. Uh, but specifically, I had argued in my first book for the principle of candor. That is, as a condition of democracy, leaders should be compelled to appear under conditions they do not control. For example, in unscripted, contested exchanges where they might be humbled and shamed. Some recently have wondered whether Trump proves the weakness of the ideal of candor, since a politics of candor on their view, rather than burdening political elites and undermining their capacity for riskless propagandistic appeals, would only favor certain politicians like Trump who feel comfortable speaking without a teleprompter, who seem personally immune from the embarrassment of gaffes and inaccuracies, and who are eager to use candid moments to propagate trivialities and lies. Again, this is a live issue, but I think it would be a mistake to conclude from the Trump presidency that candor is an empty ideal. For one thing, even if Trump in certain respects is indeed a more candid candidate than many others in recent memory, uh, it is hardly the case that Trump's public relations have been unambiguously shaped by candor. It is not candid not to hold a press conference between July and January. It's not candid not to release your tax return. It's not candid to threaten to reduce press freedom via proposed changes in libel laws, nor is it candid to physically intimidate protesters and journalists. And I would ask critics of Trump, is there anyone who wouldn't want to see more contestation rather than less? And I think, therefore, we need more candor, more critical forms of publicity, not a reduction of candor. For me, there's a lot to say about this issue, but one initial conclusion almost two months into the Trump presidency is to hold on to the value of institutions that expose and potentially humble leaders, but to realize, more than I did previously, that mere extemporaneity, mere speaking without a script, is not necessarily enough to achieve that goal to the fullest possible extent. In certain cases like that of Trump, you will need a more formal kind of aggressive cross-examination to achieve the fullest kind of candor. The last prefatory mark I'll make, the last remark about what I take to be a live issue brought into focus by the Trump campaign has to do with media. There's a long tradition in American politics of new media meaningfully affecting the style of politics and the conduct of leadership. There's the rise of radio as it was used by FDR, uh, the emergence of television in conjunction with John F. Kennedy's presidency, and now I think we're at a similar moment uh, with the emergence of Twitter in conjunction with Trump. I think what this suggests, among many things, one could talk about the ability of, the, of Twitter to bypass newspapers, and that's very important, but I think what, the, what is also being uh, put on our table as a result of this transformation is the change from being telegenic to being Twittergenic. Uh, both notions suggest that the content of your message is not enough. Uh, in order to be heard, you have to be able to survive the strictures of whatever media uh, apparatus you find yourself in. 
But there is, I think, a difference between being Twittergenic and being telegenic. Telegenic, I think, means to remain calm and poised under a visual media gaze, to manage a risky situation, to be someone viewers are content to keep watching. To be Twittergenic, by contrast, doesn't mean that you're someone we're content to continue to watch, but rather that you're someone we actively want to follow because you're likely to say or do something surprising or sensational. And I think this move from the telegenic to the twittergenic exposes the difference between these two passive organs of sense, the audio and the visual, uh, sight and hearing. Uh, tele the telegenic is biased in the direction of sight. And I think with the emergence of twittergenic presidents and other leaders, there is perhaps a move towards uh, the ear, toward, towards hearing, towards words, and a de-emphasis, however slight, of striking a good uh, visual pose on the screen. But now let me turn to my main purpose for today, which is to discuss Trump's presidency from the perspective of a plebeian model of democracy, which I have spent the last many years elaborating and defending, a model which accepts the difference between the few and the many, but which aims to burden the few. A plebeian model of democracy, therefore, is different from an oligarchy. An oligarchy also has this differentiation between the few and the many, but the purpose of that differentiation is to aggrandize and celebrate the few. For a plebeian model, by contrast, there is a differentiation between the few and the many, but the purpose of that differentiation is to contest and regulate and burden the few. And the logic for this burdening, the logic for a plebeian model of democracy, is on the one hand a prophylactic concern in protection, in trying to protect ordinary people from the threat to their liberties that are uniquely capable of being carried out by very powerful individuals. Another reason for regulating the few is that insofar as we live in a world permanently marred by unfairness, and I'll come to this later in the talk, there is some value in having the few, those who have prospered the most in a situation that is not fully fair, acknowledge this unfairness and in some small way remediate it. Now, in trying to elaborate and defend a plebeian model of democracy, I've been inspired by certain historical examples of plebeian institutions, institutions which seem to interpret democratic empowerment not simply as a making of laws, but as a regulating of the few. One of these is ostracism. The ancient Athenians would ostracize from time to time individuals, usually prominent individuals, by banishing them for 10 years' time. And I think the procedure that they used to do the ostracism is quite remarkable. Uh, there were two votes. The first vote would be every year the Athenians would ask themselves, should we ostracize anyone this year? And then only if the answer to that question was yes, would they a few weeks later decide who, should, who the ostracized person should be. And I think this uh, procedure suggests to us that the ostracism was not at all modeled on a criminal trial, where the point was to punish someone who had committed some obvious act of wrongdoing or illegality, but rather spoke to some more alternate basic urge in a democratic society to uh, single out a member of the few for special regulatory burdens. Other Athenian plebeian institutions were the ice fora, which were special taxes uniquely levied against the wealthiest citizens in times of war and other emergencies, the liturgies or special services that were required only of the wealthiest 80 or 100 families in Athens. These were honors, but they were also burdens. You had to pay for such things if you were part of these wealthy top 80 or 100 families for the building of triremes or the funding of theatrical productions or the building of monuments. Um, and there are parallel examples in Rome, especially if you were um, a wealthy citizen with a desire for an active political career in their ancient Roman Republic. You had to pay with your own money for games and banquets and processions and monuments and also often for the costs of the offices that you ran and held. And so what these institutions suggest to me is an incipient idea of compulsory noblesse oblige as a democratic um, expectation. And in any case, this becomes the, the, one of the, the central features of my elaboration and defense of a plebeian model of democracy. Now, what I find um, relevant about Trump in relationship to a plebeian model of democracy is that he embodies a threat to it that I had not considered, a blurring of the few and the many, but not in the usual way. The usual way 
that plebeianism is threatened is when an ethics of the few are put forward as an ethics of the many. But what Trump represents is rather an ethics of the many being practiced by a member of the few. Just to make this more concrete, the usual way I think plebeianism has been uh, sidestepped has been in suggesting to ordinary citizens that they too can practice the same type of ethics of elite citizens. And so consider the example of deliberative democracy, still probably the dominant ethical paradigm of citizenship today. According to the theory of deliberative democracy, what we should do, uh, ordinary citizens and elite citizens, is deliberate with each other, talk, make sincere arguments with each other, speak to each other with an open mind so that we could change our mind if someone gives us a good reason, to make reasons to each other, not to engage in strategic or manipulative appeals. And I think that this is a very good idea, but it's an especially good idea for those who sit around a decision-making table. If you sit in a parliament or if you sit around some other executive administrative table where there are real um, choices to be made, then yes, I think deliberation makes a lot of sense. But if you're an ordinary citizen whose only formal decision is likely to be the vote, I think it is ideological in the worst sense to treat ordinary citizens as if they are under the same great decision-making uh, authority, that they have the same great decision-making potential and authority as elite citizens. That's the usual way plebeianism has been challenged in suggesting that the many should act like the few. But what I want to argue this evening is that what Trump represents in at least three different ways is um, articulating perspectives that are not necessarily wrong as such, but are as wrong because he's a member of the few acting like one of the many. Now note, it's part of the logic of my argument, therefore, that I'm not going to always be criticizing every last aspect of what Trump is saying or doing. My point will be there might be some aspect in what he's doing that some other people, the many, might, if they had done it in a slightly different way, would be valuable. And so I just want to signal that approach that I'm taking to understanding Trump in light of plebeianism. Okay, so I want to give you three examples whereby Trump is acting like one of the many being one of the few. The first is the cry of unfairness. As we know, Trump has said that the system is rigged, that special interests were unfairly coordinating against his candidacy, and that he even raised the possibility during the late stages of the campaign that he might not concede the election. Some might say that there's no place for the expression of such views in a democracy, that such cries of unfairness destabilize and disrespect our political institutions. But to me, the issue is who is crying unfairness and what kind of unfairness is being objected to. It is indeed off-putting for the President of the United States, of all people, to claim that he has been the victim of an unfair political process, or for one of the richest people in the world to complain that the unfair role of money in politics has harmed him. But I think there is, in fact, genuine value in reflecting on the unfairness that darkens not just American politics, but any liberal democratic regime grounded on private pop property and the family. The fact is that plutocracy infects liberal democratic regimes worldwide, yet this fact is not something that most contemporary philosophers, politicians, or ordinary citizens have been willing to acknowledge. Now, what do I mean by plutocracy? I take it that um, plutocracy is the unfair incursion of economic inequality into realms it is not supposed to tread above all the realms of political opportunity and the realms of educational opportunity. And so a society would be free from plutocracy if similarly talented and motivated citizens, regardless of their economic situation, could expect to have roughly equal prospects of influencing elections, running for office, having an active political life. And in education, we could say that a society is free from plutocracy if similarly talented and motivated children regardless of their socioeconomic background, could expect to have roughly equal prospects of success in life. And I think that a plutocracy-free society is a noble aspiration, and I think that these two aspects of having um, no plutocracy in your educational system and no plutocracy in your political system are widely held among liberals throughout the world today. But the first point I want to make here is that it's not fully realizable, that we should not expect to have freedom from plutocracy in our political and educational systems so far, so long as we have private property and the family. 
And this is not something that I think people reflect on today. There are many people who worry about plutocracy as a correctable problem. But what I'm trying to say is that plutocracy is not fully correctable. We could always do better and should try to do better, but it's something that will always darken our liberal democratic regimes. Now, in saying this, though, I'm actually not saying something completely new. I'm just returning to what I take to be with common wisdom among political thinkers prior to the emergence of liberal democracy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Let me draw your attention to some political thinkers, some popular Republican thinkers from an earlier era. One of these is James Harrington from the 17th century. Where there is inequality of estates, there must be inequality of power. A century later, Montesquieu, it is impossible that riches will not secure power. Now there's a big debate among Republican thinkers about what to do about this. On the radical side, you have people like Plato who say we should get rid of private property and the family among the guardian class because they're going to distort the selection of the virtuous and the wise. On the other side, you have Republican thinkers who are very happy to have formal institutions that give disproportionate political voice to the wealthy. And then you have people like Montesquieu and Harrington who are somewhere in between. They worry about too much inequality. Uh, at the same time, they want to exclude the property list from citizenship, and they want to have gradated civic classes that give the wealthier citizens more political voice. But the point I mean to draw your attention to is their descriptive confidence that, of course, economic inequality would reproduce itself in political inequality. Closer to our American experience would be James Madison. Madison, too, I believe, also thought that, of course, economic inequality would reproduce itself in different differential and superior political opportunities for the wealthy. Madison in the 1780s as a constitutional framer initially opposed universal white male suffrage. He thought that there ought to be a property requirement. But by the end of his life in the 1820s, he foresaw that the new era that he was in, that, that the new liberal democratic era was one in which there would no longer be any basis for restricting the suffrage on the basis of economic class. But he did worry about how property would be defended when it was only, um, when, when all people, all white males, all, including very poor ones, would be able to vote. And I've put this quote here for you because among a few other features that he acknowledges will likely protect the interests of property, one that I bold for you here is what he calls the ordinary influence possessed by property. That in a republic that had juridical equality, where there's no formal uh, superior opportunities for the rich. The rich would, by the very nature of being rich, expect to have disproportionate political opportunities. Now, what did Madison mean by the ordinary influence possessed by property? What might we mean by it? Uh, one dynamic is what I would call the fluidity of power. That at high levels of intensity, wealth translates into political power and to fame. And, and political power translates into wealth and fame, and fame translates into um, wealth and power. We can imagine exceptions. You can imagine someone who's wealthy, very wealthy, but not powerful or famous. Think of a baby who's been born to rich parents. Uh, you can think of someone who's famous, but not wealthy or powerful. Think of an infamous criminal in jail for life. Um, you can think of someone who's powerful, but not famous or wealthy. Think perhaps of Nancy Reagan's astrologist. But in general, um, we, I think, expect that at high levels of intensity, these, these uh, forms of power flow into each other. And Republican contemporaries of Madison certainly thought this way. Take, for example, Adam Smith, who when he wondered why it is that we admire wealthy people and want to be like them, fell back not on the material advantages that the wealthy had, although these two were clearly important, but on their being visible to others and being seen by others and thereby having the popularity that would be a prerequisite for a political career. To be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, complacency, and approbation are all the advantages which we can propose to derive from wealth. It is the vanity, not the ease or the pleasure, which interests us. And John Adams says something similar, that what is really difficult about being poor is not simply the material aspect of it, but the invisibility of it. The poor man feels himself out of the sight of others, groping in the dark. Mankind takes no notice of him. He rambles and wanders unheeded. In the midst of a crowd, at church, in the market, he is in as much obscurity as he would be in a garret or a cellar. 
He is not disapproved, censured, or reproached. He is only not seen. In addition to the fluidity of power, we know from generations of social scientific research across nationally that socioeconomic class um, lead, is correlated with and, and causes more uh, likelihood of, of political behavior. The wealthier you are, the more likely you are to vote, and the more likely you are to engage in extra electoral forms of civic uh, action. And so there are many findings that show this. I, I, I like the first quote, the political advantage of those citizens, more advantage in socioeconomic terms, is found in all nations, certainly in all those for which we have data. You'd expect as good social scientists, Verba and his co-authors would make no statements about countries for which they don't have data, but there's this urge to universalize the finding, and I think with good reason. No democratic nation lives up to the ideal of participatory equality. It's not just in the United States and where plutocracy is quite severe, but everywhere, including um, the most egalitarian countries in the world, which I believe to be the Northern European liberal democracies. Europe is different in degree, not kind. Uh, you might think that because in Northern Europe there really isn't the same type of poverty that we have in the United States, or because there is proportional representation and um, multi-party systems which incentivize people to vote even for losing candidates, uh, or because there aren't onerous registration rules, it's easier for people to vote and, and indeed turnout is much higher. You might think for these reasons that the role of, of socioeconomic status has been neutralized, but it has not been neutralized. It's less, but it's still there. People in Europe who are wealthier are more likely to vote, and even more, they're more likely to engage in extra electoral forms of civic engagement. And so I think plutocracy is a problem not just for America, but for any liberal democracy that has private property and the family. Uh, the standard approach, I think, among liberal Democrats is to imagine if only we had the right campaign finance legislation, if only we had the right educational system, we could neutralize our political and educational systems. I don't mean to in any way uh, denigrate those efforts. There's a world of difference between living in Finland and living in the United States when it comes to education and, and political opportunity. But I do think that even in Finland, even in Northern Europe, you're going to find uh, plutocratic aspects to the society. A final aspect to the ordinary influence possessed by property, to use Madison's term, would be to, to draw attention to how recent research has suggested that inequality itself, divorced from the material aspects, demotivates civic engagement and even has negative health outcomes. We know that one of the reasons people with fewer means participate less is that they don't have the resources. They don't have the time. They don't have the money. And we know that people with fewer resources are likely to be unhealthy. They're going to have access to worse housing, substandard housing, be closer to pollution, um, and engage, eat less healthy food, and engage in less healthy behaviors like smoking and, and be obese. But even controlling for all of those factors, what these studies suggest is that simply being lowered down on a socioeconomic hierarchy, regardless of the material aspects to it, is demotivating of civic efficacy, depresses your likelihood of participating in politics, and is dangerous for your health. Why? Perhaps because being lowered down on a socioeconomic hierarchy raises your cortisol levels, which causes stress, and lowers your serotonin levels, uh, which causes depression, and both stress and depression lead to lower lifespans. There's a fascinating study from England, the British Whitehall study, that's been going on for 40 years or more, which has studied the health outcomes of British civil servants living in London, all having the same health care, all with some basic education and a salary, and what you see controlling for the ways in which lower economic means also inhibits your health is that every stage of the administrative hierarchy, those higher up the hierarchy, have longer lifespans. And so this issue too, the role of inequality itself, is also a dimension in addition to the fluidity of power and what social science has taught us about socioeconomic status predicting political engagement that make, ought to make us understand plutocracy as a permanent aspect of our liberal democratic regimes. Now it's not something that philosophers have been so keen to acknowledge. True, John Rawls, who is probably still the most influential recent philosopher of the Liberal Democratic Project, in one passage does admit that we should not expect full fair equality of opportunity with regard to education because of the family. As he writes, the principle of fair opportunity can be only imperfectly carried out 
at least as long as the institution of the family exists. It is impossible in practice to secure equal chances of achievement in culture for those similarly endowed. But this is by far the exception. Rawls's usual perspective is to uphold to us the possibility of a plutocracy-free political system and a plutocracy-free educational system. He affirms these two liberties as what liberal democracies should be trying to um, obtain. The first is that all citizens, whatever their economic or social position, must be sufficiently equal in the sense that all have a fair opportunity to hold public office and to affect the outcome of elections, that there should not be plutocracy in the political system. And the second, those who have the same level of talent and ability and the same willingness to use these gifts should have the same prospects of success regardless of their social class of origin, that there shouldn't be plutocracy in the educational system. And Rawls' sunniness in this regard is by no means specific to him, but is just the best known example of a broader trend in contemporary liberal democratic thought where philosophers from a wide degree of perspectives continue to affirm the possibility of a plutocracy-free liberal democratic state. Take G.A. Cohen, the liberal Marxist uh, thinker who argued in 2009 that un-American experience shows that election regulation of a sort Rawls would endorse can produce political democracy under a wide inequality of income and wealth. And so Cohen thinks not only is it possible to achieve a plutocracy-free society, but that there are certain countries in the world today that are doing it. And unfortunately, I think that that's just simply not true. Uh, from the other side of the political spectrum, uh, certain libertarians, so-called bleeding heart libertarians, who affirm the importance of political equality also share with Rawls an optimism that we can neutralize unfair uh, uh, advantages of the wealthy in politics. And so John Tomasi has recently written, free market fairness shares the social democratic idea that the status of citizens as political equals must be fully respected. And it's not just philosophers who think that we can get rid of plutocracy in our educational and political systems, but ordinary citizens, especially Americans. As an example of this, consider Page and Jacob's 2009 book, Class War, where they diagnosed what they found to be a prevalent conservative egalitarianism among American citizens. What's conservative about Americans' conservative egalitarianism is that they don't like redistribution. But what's egalitarian about Americans' conservative egalitarianism is that they think that they, we ought to create societies where there's fair equality of opportunity, where, in the words of the authors, there's support for the idea that individuals that, that, that individuals should enjoy the opportunity to go as far as their work and skill will take them, that there should be no plutocracy in the educational and political systems. Uh, consider as a final example uh, one of the founding documents of the Liberal Democratic Project, the 1948 UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These two articles espouse uh, the expectation of liberal democracies being free from plutocracy in their political and educational systems. Article 21, everyone has the right of equal access to public service in his country. Article 26, technical and professional education shall be made generally available and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. And so to conclude my first point, uh, my point would be that there is indeed unfairness in our democracy, but it's something that afflicts the many, not the few, the few are, by definition, those who have prospered the most within an imperfectly fair system. And so it doesn't make sense for the few to complain that they have been victims of plutocracy. But it does make sense for ordinary citizens to recognize the plutocracy that exists and on the basis of it to expect special compensatory burdens be placed on both political and economic elites. I want to move now to my second of three points, points that are Trump is acting as one of the many when he's really a member of the few, and thereby blurring the distinction between the few and the many, which is important to me as a supporter of a plebeian model of liberal democracy. The second of these issues has to do with vulgarity. Trump has said or done many vulgar things in the campaign, using profanity, discussing his genitalia, insulting women based on their appearance, taunting his rivals with silly epithets, as well as unleashing unseemly anger in his speeches and general tone. And in the infamous bus video, we heard graphic language from 2005 of how Trump propositioned women and may have groped them without their consent. Now, I do not mean in any way to sanction these behaviors, but I do mean to say there is, after all, a place for vulgarity in our politics, but it ought to come from the many. 
The Latin word vulgarity comes from the word vulgus, or crowd, which reminds us etymologically of its connection to a kind of popular politics. Uh, now, if we define vulgarity as a kind of discourse that is not fully civil, a kind of discourse that indicates we don't expect to be friends with our rivals, then I think there is a place for what I call principled vulgarity in a plebeian democracy. Um, now, what do I mean by principled vulgarity? There are many aspects to it. One is what I would call methodological vulgarity. It is problematic, although I think essential, to speak the language of the few and the many, because you have to face this question of how do you define the few? Where's the cutoff between the few and the many? And I think, honestly, there is an undeniably arbitrary aspect to that cutoff, but it's a type of arbitrariness that plebeians should be willing to own. We already use the category of the least advantaged, which is also, to some degree, arbitrary. And my point would be that we need to extend our willingness to transact in class-based categories and not just have a notion of the least advantaged, but a notion of the most advantaged. And so that's one type of vulgarity. Um, another type is non-deliberative discourse. Ordinary citizens, groups, people who are part of the many, can make a difference in the world when they join together and affix themselves with other like-minded citizens. If you are part of an electoral block that has been heated, if you are part of a public opinion block that is making its opinion felt, if you're part of a protest movement, in all these respects, you can make a difference in the world. But when you make a difference in this way, it's not by deliberating. It's not by having your individual voice listened to. It's not by exercising your individual judgment. It's by being part of a mass, of a larger group. And so that inability to deliberate and engage in speech, that being confined to a vulgus or a crowd, is another aspect of principled vulgarity. And related to that would be if you happen to be face to face in the same room as a very powerful person, as a member of the many, your likely way of engaging with that powerful person is not in the conversation, but through some form of interjection that may very well be out of order. Um, another vulgar aspect of plebeian politics is the desire to see the few burdened, since plebeianism seeks burdens that exceed the individual guilt of anyone who's a member of the advantaged. Remember the ostracism example. Someone who's ostracized hasn't necessarily done anything wrong, but they're being ostracized um, as a way for a plebeian society to, to regulate and burden members of the few simply for being members of the few. And I think in its enviousness, there's something vulgar about that uh, procedure. There's also the vulgarity of certain quasi-rancorous sentiments, like indignation at living in a society that is not fully fair and where one's dignity as a free and equal citizen is not being fully respected. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a second, how am I defending uh, my plebeian model of democracy? I've just gone over all the ways in which it's vulgar. How could that in any way make it more attractive? Uh, and I conclude this second point by observing that what I'm trying to do in my political theory is democratize a Machiavellian instinct that in politics sometimes one has to learn how not to be good and that in political responsibility um, is or irreducible uh, to being moral. Now, this is a controversial idea in political thought. There's a long-standing dirty hands tradition which says political ethics is not ethics as such. And to be politically responsible, you sometimes have to dirty your hands and do something that's not right. Uh, my problem with that tradition is not necessarily that it's wrong, indeed I'm subscribing to it in my own way, but that it has almost always been restricted to the ethical purview of elite citizens. Who gets to dirty his or her hands? In the tradition of political thought, it's almost always the prince or the leading politician who has to steal or deceive or even sometimes kill in order to secure the state. Now, I'm not advocating stealing or killing or, or deceiving, uh, but I am saying that if we're going to play this game of having uh, morally ambiguous political ethics, there ought to be some application on the popular level for those ethics. And it shouldn't just be the few who get to behave like in a Machiavellian fashion. There ought to be a possibility for the many behaving in a Machiave Machiavellian fashion. And I see a plebeian model of democracy with its vulgar aspects as contributing to what um, popular Machiavellianism might look like. This brings me to my third example of Trump as someone who is wrongly acting as one of the many, sorry, yes, wrongly acting as one of the many when in fact he's a member of the few. And this third issue has to do with not caring. One of the most disturbing aspects of the Trump candidacy was the sense that at some basic level he simply didn't care about his behavior, 
whether he won or lost, or what any of it would mean for the country. Perhaps Trump has changed in this regard since taking office, but it is remarkable how often as a candidate he would use the phrase, I don't care about this or that. And YouTube has uh, compiled a montage of some of these if you want to pursue that issue afterwards. There's also the fact corroborated by numerous reports that Trump did not enter the race in any way expecting to win. And relatedly, he would often remind voters how rich he was, how he didn't need to bother himself with politics, and would be more than happy to return to his private life if need be. And his lack of preparation and his lack of discipline while on the public stage, though in many respects part of his charm and appeal, also seemed to indicate someone who simply doesn't care as much as all the others who have previously sought and won the presidency in recent memory. It might seem that there's no place for not caring about democratic politics, but I'd say there is a place, but it's something for ordinary citizens, not presidential candidates. Due to the inevitable stresses and strains of an insufficiently fair or egalitarian political life, ordinary citizens will rightly, from time to time, not care about politics so as to maintain their spirit and their sanity. Now, this idea is not as bizarre as it might seem. If one consults the earliest, most ancient records we have of egalitarian thinking in the West, we find continual recognition that a person committed to egalitarianism would also be someone likely periodically not to care about politics. And so let me start with the example of Achilles. Uh, as far as I can tell, as far as I know, this is the earliest instance of egalitarian thinking in the West literary tradition. And the context is Achilles in Book Nine of the Iliad, where he um, has initially left the war out of protest because he didn't like the distribution of slave girls. And now that wrong has been righted. He's been the girl has been returned to him, as well as various other things, treasure, titles to rule. And he still doesn't want to re-enter uh, war and politics. He still wants to stay out. And what he says is um, this remarkable egalitarian line: "An equal fate to the one who stays behind, as to the one who struggles well." in a single honor are held both the low and the high. And so this expression of equality is being expressed by someone not in the manner of let's go reform politics and make it more democratic, but it's being expressed by someone in the very moment of his indifference to politics. Now what explains Achilles' mentality? As I interpret it, uh, Achilles seems to be uh, inviting us to think of this thought experiment. Imagine for a moment if you considered all lives equally desirable, uh, the beggar on the street and the billionaire, the outcast and the prime minister. And if you thought this, if you actually thought that all lives were equally desirable, you would on the one hand be espousing a very egalitarian spirit. But on the other hand, you would be thinking in a way that would make it impossible for you to be political. How could you really take political action if wealth and power no longer had any meaning? And I think that it's not just with regard to equality, but with regard to other democratic egalitarian commitments that one can, in radicalizing them, in intensifying them, also drain them of their political potential. So just give one other example of this. Consider free speech. What does it mean to engage in free speech? The normal connotation is to be able to speak in a governmental setting or in the public square and not be punished for one's uh, communication. But if you think of free speech in a more intense or radicalized way, as a speech that is now stripped of its instrumentality, poetic speech. And it's not by chance, I think, that Achilles in his hut in Book Nine is singing about war and politics, becoming Homer, and no longer being a political actor. Then you have a speech that is free, but also not obviously connected to politics. Or if you think about intimate speech, a speech where you really say what you think, a speech that is no longer circumspect, or strategic, or in any way cautious, that's a speech that is free, but seems to have very little function in a political sphere. In any case, the point I would make with regard to Achilles is here is someone who is an egalitarian and in his egalitarianism not wanting to participate in politics. Now, you might still think this is a very bizarre idea, but it really isn't so bizarre because if you go to Plato and his account of the democratic person, you find an account of someone who's not participating in politics all the time, but often is not participating. Plato describes the democratic person in, this, in these terms. The democratic person lives on yielding day by day to the desired hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute. At other times he drinks only water and is on a diet. 
Sometimes he goes in for physical training, and other times he's idle and neglects everything. And sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. He often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. If he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried in that direction. If moneymakers, in that one. There's neither order nor necessity in his life, but he calls it pleasant, free, blessedly happy, and he follows it for as long as he lives. And what I take Plato to be saying here is the democratic character who has a radical notion of equality and thereby sees all life pursuits as equally desirable will not, for that reason, be able to be fully committed to politics itself. And when in politics, won't be able to act with the modicum of self-sameness required for responsible political action. Uh, a third example of the ancient egalitarian uh, association of egalitarianism with political indifference, or at least a periodic and partial indifference, would come from uh, Otanes, who is the first, albeit legendary, democratic theorist. Otanes comes down to us from his Herodotus's histories from around 450 BCE, and the event in question is from the prior century, the sixth century BCE, where there's been an overthrow of a regime in Persia, and now the people are having the first recorded debate about what type of government should they have, rule of the one, rule of the few, or rule of the many. And Otanes rises to support isonomia, freedom before the law, conventionally the, the, translated as, as rule of the many. He, he is the advocate for rule of the many. Um, but his proposal is rejected, and monarchy is uh, chosen instead. And Otanes makes a request. He asks, please, can I be exempted from the new jurisdiction? Can I not have to live under this regime? Can I be free from it? And they let him do that. And what we have also in this, uh, in this context is Otanes' remarkable words, I desire neither to rule nor be ruled. Um, a reversal of the much more familiar rendering of democratic ethics, canonical since Aristotle, of ruling and being ruled in turn. Now one could read these words as a statement for why Otanes wants to flee the monarchy, but because of their open-endedness, they could also be read as an authentic expression of an alternate democratic ideal, not the sharing of politics on equal terms, but the reduction of political relations. And aren't all of us in this room, insofar as we are Democrats, somewhat similar to Otanes in both wanting a more democratic society and advocating for it in some partial way, but also having to confront a society that frustrates our egalitarian impulses and that strikes us as something that is not sufficiently democratic. I think it's valuable to keep this ancient tradition in mind, though I don't mean in any way to be endorsing quietism. The point is not to withdraw from politics, but rather I think um, in the words of T.S. Eliot in his poem Ash Wednesday, um, to care and not to care. And I suppose the point that I'm trying to make in this final third point is that egalitarianism can underwrite both commitments. Being an egalitarian can tell you how to care about democracy, but it also can give you a mentality for periodically not caring. So uncaring has a place for ordinary citizens, but not for leaders. In conclusion, uh, let me just revisit a constant observation from the campaign that Trump says or does what a lot of ordinary people are privately thinking. Sometimes this was said as a compliment. Trump is speaking for the silent majority. Sometimes this was said as a critique. Too many Americans themselves harbor the same offensive views as the president they support. I'd say something different, that we should not expect our leaders to mirror ordinary citizens, that we occupy different positions, that we, do, that we not only uh, ought to be held to different standards, but we have different roles to play. It is the role of ordinary citizens as progressive beings to cry unfairness, to be vulgar in certain respects, to be indignant, and for their own sanity to temporarily transcend politics from time to time. But it's the role of elite citizens, both the very rich and very powerful, to abide by the classical norms of leadership, eloquence, deliberation, statesmanship, and further, to be publicly burdened in partial redress for the shadow of unfairness that will always darken any liberal democratic regime. Certain kinds of representation, certain kinds of mirroring of the many by the few are in fact hostile to democracy. Thank you. <laughs>